In this video, I'm going to discuss the middle six poems of the WJEC Educast Poetry Anthology and what they might compare to. The reason why I'm talking about the middle six poems in this video is because in that one there, I've already discussed the first six. So you might want to watch that at some point. Anyway, those middle six poems in the anthology, what do they compare to nicely? Let's find out. Hey Revision Squad, it's me, Liam, aka Mr Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and I am back with another GCSE Poetry Anthology revision video for you. This is the second part of my discussion of which poems in the WJEC Educast Poetry Anthology compare nicely. If this is part two, then there's obviously a part one, which is what I was talking about in the video's opening. Today, I will be covering the middle six poems in the anthology, going from As Imperceptibly As Grief, all the way to Hawk Roosting. Before I get started, how about you grab a pen and some paper so that you can make notes? And why not drop this video a like? It helps me out loads and I really do appreciate it. Okay, so which poems could we compare Dickinson's As Imperceptibly As Grief to? Well, you could consider comparing it to A Wife in London. Both poems are about loss in some way. The persona in Dickinson's poem has presumably lost someone, given that they are grieving, and the poem also marks their loss of this emotion too, whilst the eponymous wife in Hardy's poem loses her husband. Strong emotions are prevalent in these poems, especially grief, and the weather and environment often reflects this. In Dickinson's poem, The Morning Foreign Shone shows the strangeness that the persona feels, not only because of the unusual syntax in this phrase, but also because of how unnatural something extremely natural feels. Summer, which perhaps could be seen as a life personified, also adds to the way that the weather and setting have been used. Similarly, the fog in a wife in London could be seen as symbolic of the wife's grief or negative emotions, whilst images of light flickering and fading is another instance of the setting reflecting the mood. If you wanted to contrast these poems and look at their differences, it's worth thinking about how time is presented in these poems. In As Imperceptibly as Grief, time is shown to be a positive thing, as it is time that allows the persona's grief to pass. This is immensely different to the presentation of time in A Wife in London. In this poem, time is presented as cruel, because it is time that determines that the wife received the two messages in the wrong order, which only compounded her feelings of loss and woe. This presentation of time also adds to the hope or hopelessness of the two poems. As imperceptibly as grief ends with a fairly hopeful tone, as highlighted by the final word, beautiful. Yet A Wife in London ends in a much more hopeless way. In the second part of the poem, we see that the wife's feelings have spiralled downwards, as evidenced by The Fog Hangs Thicker, and the irony of the new love that they would learn. Contrasting these poems from a different angle, you could choose to look at their structures. As imperceptibly as grief is quite disordered in the sense that it has no strict rhyme scheme. This could mean that the passing of grief is unpredictable and that it is not a linear process. On the other hand, A Wife in London has quite a regular structure. The rhyme scheme is consistent, the stanzas are the same length, and so on. This tight control could mirror the control that time has over the wife and her emotions, accentuating its potential for cruelty. Now maybe you fancy comparing Dickinson's poem to something else, so why not compare it to the prelude? Now both poems feature strong emotions. In Dickinson's poem we have that grief that eventually passes. In Wordsworth's poem, the strong emotions present are firstly glee, as seen in words such as rapture and pleasures, but later, deep, deep disturbance and unsettlement, as seen in tumult and melancholy. Another similarity that these poems share is that they are similarly unstructured. By this I mean that they have no regular rhyme scheme, and that they are a single stanza each. <laughs> 
I think that this could reflect nature in some ways, as this makes the forms of the poems quite organic and natural. In Dickinson's poem, this could suggest that it is natural for strong emotions to pass over time, whereas in Wordsworth's poem, this could mirror nature's dominance over man. Now, these poems can also be contrasted. They are both about loss, but loss in different senses. In Dickinson's poem, the loss is more literal. The persona appears to have lost somebody and they are losing their feelings of grief, maybe. On the other hand, the prelude is about a metaphorical loss, that's loss of innocence and childlike glee. The theme of loss is central to both poems, but they deal with it in very different ways, and so maybe this would be a good thing to consider when discussing both of them. The presentation of time is also very different in these poems. As I've said already, time is presented in a positive light in Dickinson's poem. Conversely, time well, it's shown in a less positive way in Wordsworth's poem. Getting older is quite literally a measure of time, and getting older seems to be associated with that loss of innocence, and so time is not shown to be particularly great. Nature is also present in both poems, but again, in different ways. As Imperceptibly as Grief is not explicitly a nature poem per se, but instead uses nature frequently in its imagery, as a way of making something intense, deep, and perhaps unfamiliar, much more accessible to the readers. In The Prelude, nature is at the poem's heart. To simplify this distinction, the prelude is about nature, whereas as imperceptibly as grief uses nature to discuss something other than the natural world. Rita Dove's cosy apologia. What could you compare that to? You could compare it to living space. If you want my detailed explanation behind that possible comparison, go back and watch part one of this mini-series. On the other hand, you could also choose to compare Cozy Apologia to Keats's poem To Autumn. These two poems have a few similarities. Both are place poems, in the sense that they are about how people interact with their surroundings. In Cozy Apologia, Dove's home is akin to a wooden womb. It protects and nurtures her. In Keats's poem, we see people interacting with their surroundings to likewise survive. Both poems are full of very strong, very simple, concrete images. In Cozy Apologia, this could indicate the sense of familiarity and security that the house provides Dove. In To Autumn, the abundance of images parallels the bounty of harvest time. Furthermore, both of these poems have a near devotional element to them. Cozy Apologia is dedicated to Fred, Rita Dove's husband, and a great deal of the poem idolises him. Similarly, Two Autumn takes the ode form to praise and cherish the eponymous season. Throughout both poems, language adds to this sense of devotion too. And of course, if you wanted to contrast these poems and discuss more overt differences, you could choose to look at how nature is presented in these poems. In Cozy Apologia, man and nature take places on opposing sides and have a relationship of conflict, with Storm Floyd rampaging outside and causing chaos and destruction that Dove ultimately seeks shelter from. In To Autumn, though, man and nature have a much more harmonious and symbiotic relationship, with nature and man working together and nature ultimately sacrificing itself for the good of man. The different presentation of nature, or man's relationship with it, might also have a bearing on the rhyme schemes of these poems too. The shifting rhyme scheme in Cozy Apologia, by which I mean how the rhyme scheme changes stanza by stanza, could mirror Storm Floyd's destructive potential, whereas the consistent ode rhyme scheme in To Autumn reinforces the harmonious relationship between man and nature presented in this poem. Let's talk about Valentine. What could we compare it to? Well, you could compare it to Lord Byron's poem, She Walks in Beauty, but I actually discussed that in part one of this mini series. So make sure you've watched that for my detailed explanation of this possible comparison. Or you could even compare Valentine to Sonnet 43. These poems are clearly both love poems, 
Barrett Browning was addressing her future husband, and Duffy writes, either as herself or as a persona, to an unknown addressee. This is particularly shown by the use of pronouns in both poems, as they repeat the first person pronoun I throughout, and also use second person pronouns you or thee to make it clear that a specific person is being addressed in each poem. There is also a reference to marriage at the end of each poem. In Valentine, Duffy uses the image of rings of onions shrinking to a wedding ring, whereas Barrett Browning claims that she will love Robert Browning better after death. By making these references to marriage, the love in each poem seems genuine. You could also argue that the persona of each poem is somewhat insecure in their love. Duffy's persona expresses doubt when they say that the onion scent is possessive and faithful for as long as we are, which indicates that they are unsure if their love will be permanent. You could argue that Barrett Browning appears insecure in her poem because of her constant repetition of I love thee. Is she so desperate to cling on to that relationship because she is worried it won't last? If you wanted to contrast these poems, a great place for you to look is at structure and form. Valentine is structurally irregular and sticks to no defined poetic form. Sonnet 43 though, well obviously it's a super traditional sonnet, the epitome of love poetry. Here then, we can see that there is a distinction between tradition and innovation. Using context, we know that the love depicted in Sonnet 43 is traditional, by which I mean heterosexual. Similarly, we could use context to say that the love being discussed in Valentine, it might not be heterosexual, given that Duffy is openly bisexual. In the 90s, when she wrote this poem, Duffy's sexuality was seen as non-conventional and was not widely accepted. Was this why her love poem rejects the traditional sonnet form? Thomas Hardy's poem, A Wife in London. Which poems could we compare that to? Well, of course, there is Armitage's poem, The Manhunt. And guess what? I've already discussed that comparison in part one of this mini series. So, you know, go and watch it. But you could also choose to compare it to Mamet's Wood by Owen Shears. Both poems are about war, but are interesting because they do not explicitly show soldiers in battle, and instead show the aftermath of battle. But they do it in different ways, so we'll talk more about that specifically in just a little bit. Perhaps both Hardy and Shears want to express that war does more than impact soldiers, and its impact is felt universally. Furthermore, images of fragility abound in both poems. The waning taper, glimmering street lamp and flickering fire in A Wife in London, and the various body parts and bones mentioned in Mamet's Wood. However, there are a number of points where the two poems contrast. Although both poems are about one or more dead soldiers, the language used to describe this in A Wife in London is much more euphemistic. The worm knows the dead soldier's hand and he has fallen. Whereas the language in Mamet's Wood is much more blunt, given that Shears just straight up lists those broken body parts. This difference could be because the wife in Hardy's poem has an intensely strong emotional connection with the dead soldier whereas the omniscient persona in Shears' poem is much more detached, having no personal connection to the dead. This could also explain why the poems deal with the aftermath of war in different ways. Hardy focuses on the personal aftermath of war through depicting the wife's sorrow, whereas Shears focuses more on the environmental aftermath of war when he writes about the earth trying to heal. On a slightly different note, both poems have slightly different tones. Both are negative, for sure, but in different ways. A Wife in London has a sort of hopeless, despondent tone, which is particularly accentuated by the cruel irony of time and the liveliness of the dead husband's letter. Mamet's Wood, meanwhile, is critical in places, which you can see in phrases like wasted young and boots that outlasted them. Given that the narrative of a wife in London is mediated from the wife's viewpoint, 
the despondent tone makes sense, as does the critical tone in Mamet's Wood, when you consider that the omniscient persona is reflecting on the destruction of World War I many, many, many years later. Seamus Heaney's poem, Death of a Naturalist. You know, the one with all the frogs. Which poems does it compare nicely to? Well, first of all, we could think about Two Autumn by John Keats. Both of these poems are focused on nature and are incredibly image heavy. In Heaney's poem, we get incredibly vivid descriptions of the flax dam, the insects, the frog spawn, tadpoles and frogs. Likewise, Keats's poem contains rich descriptions of fruits and flowers and wildlife and harvest time. I would say that both of these poems feature so much imagery in order to reflect the fascination and admiration that the people in the poems have for nature. As much as these two poems are both about nature, they tackle it in different ways. Although both poems are about man's interaction with nature, the outcome of this interaction is very different. The young person in Death of a Naturalist absolutely adores nature to begin with. They collect frog spawn, listen to their teacher talk about frogs, and so on. But at the end of the poem, nature seems to turn on man and adopt an antagonistic role, becoming an enemy rather than a friend. Ultimately, the child is terrified at the end. Now this contrasts nicely with Two Autumn, in which man and nature work alongside each other for the benefit of man. This poem presents a much more harmonious relationship. Time is also presented differently in these poems. The passing of time seems to be natural, yet negative in Death of a Naturalist. Because the tadpoles have aged and become frogs, they have become big and strong enough to become adversarial, or at least scary to a young child. Contrast this with the presentation of time in Two Autumn, in which the season is personified in an incredibly positive way, given that it is not only extremely helpful, but also selfless and sacrificial too by the poem's end. There is a slight twinge of sadness when it becomes clear that autumn is coming to an end, dying if you will, but there is a minuscule shred of hope too, given that if winter is to come next, then spring will come after that, then summer, and then autumn will return. So I mentioned death a moment ago, and the types of death present in these two poems differs. The death in two autumn is much more literal. Nature must be slain so that man may benefit and survive. And there is the argument that Autumn dies at the end of the poem too, which is a bit more abstract. The death present in Heaney's poem is also more abstract, as although no lives are lost, there is a metaphorical death of a naturalist. The young child's love for nature dies as the frogs terrify him. The final basis for contrasting these poems is their structure. There is no clear rhyme scheme in Death of the Naturalist, whereas To Autumn has a set pattern, being an ode. I argue that this shows who is more powerful between man and nature. The unorganised, organic structure of Death of the Naturalist implies that it is nature that is superior, which is also suggested by the outcome of the conflict between the child and the frogs. Alternatively, the heavily ordered and almost artificial structuring of Two Autumn shows that it is man, Keats, who is superior, as that nature's wilderness can be tamed and controlled. This too mirrors the content of the poem, as nature dies, whereas man lives. But maybe you don't like the poem Two Autumn. Maybe you don't get Keats's obsession with harvest. Fair enough. In which case, why not compare Death of a Naturalist to The Prelude? These poems compare so wonderfully that I'm not even going to begin talking about how they might contrast. They just have so much in common. To be honest, if I was sitting this exam and I was given one of these two poems, I would almost certainly compare it to the other. So both of these poems are about nature and how people, in particular young people, interact with it. This interaction relates to the strong emotions in these poems. There is fascination and adoration and immense pleasure in the first half of them when the young people are having fun out and about in nature. But this shifts to terror 
and disturbance when nature interacts with them. Time passes in both poems, which triggers an immense change in the young person at the heart of each poem, which is a metaphorical death, that loss of a childlike innocence and glee. Both of these poems are autobiographical to an extent too, as both poets had rural upbringings at the very least. Furthermore, neither poem is particularly structured, which perhaps suggests that nature has power over man, or that it cannot be controlled by man. Honestly, these two poems are perfect for each other, a match made in heaven. And now for the last poem that I will be comparing in this video, Hawk Roosting by Ted Hughes. There will be a part three to this mini series very soon, so make sure you're subscribed to this channel so that you don't miss it when it does come out. Anyway, which poems could you compare Hawk Roosting to? Well, how about Ozymandias? This is a pairing that I absolutely love. I think these two poems compare wonderfully, but why do I think that? Well, first of all, arrogance lies at the centre of both poems, and this manifests itself in a number of ways. First of all, you could consider the arrogance of the hawk and of Ozymandias in relation to the titles of the poems in which they appear. In each instance, the poem is named after them. This could show arrogance as it suggests that these personas consider themselves to be so important that things should be named after them. Yes, I am aware that it was actually the poets who chose the titles for these poems, but they could have done this with these two personas' sense of importance in mind. Moving to a more solid point of comparison then, you could look at how the arrogance of the hawk and Ozymandias informs the religious references that they make. The hawk claims that it took the whole of creation to make it, suggesting that it thinks it is God's masterpiece. Yet when it holds creation in its foot or revolves it all slowly, the hawk claims that it is now more powerful than its creator. Likewise, when Ozymandias addresses God as seen in Look on my works, ye mighty, he tells God to despair, which implies that Ozymandias believes that his vast empire is superior to all of God's creation, which is super arrogant. Finally, the structure of these two poems could also mirror the arrogance of the hawk and Ozymandias. Now, these poems do not follow the same structure, but their structures could still achieve the same effect. The consistent four-line stanzas of hawk roosting could show the hawk's tight control of everything around it, and when this is coupled with the final line, I am going to keep things like this, we can see that it thinks the way it is doing things is perfect and cannot be improved. The structure of Ozymandias, on the other hand, is a sonnet, that's typical love poem form. By using the sonnet form to talk about himself, it could be suggested that Ozymandias is in love with himself, which is another way of saying that he is massively arrogant. You could choose to contrast these poems too. Although both feature powerful entities, it is interesting that one is an animal and one is a person. Hawk roosting suggests that the natural world, or elements of it, are all powerful, whereas Ozymandias tries to stake a claim that he, a man, is omnipotent. What's interesting though is that one of these claims for ultimate power is challenged and another is not. In Hawk Roosting, the Hawk has no rival, no threat, and it appears that it will retain complete control over its world, something that is reinforced by that final line. In Ozymandias, however, we see that time and nature will eventually defeat man, as Ozymandias' empire has fallen and nothing of it, aside from his shattered statue, remains. If we were to ask ourselves what is more important, man or nature, then these two poems seem to provide definitive proof that it is nature, not man, that is more powerful. Maybe you don't like this pairing as much as I do, and that's okay. Instead, why not compare Hawk Roosting with To Autumn by John Keats? Both poems are, after all, nature poems, but more than that, they show the brutality of nature, making them honest rather than romanticised.
This brutality is seen clearly in hawk roosting through the eponymous bird's actions. It is a living killing machine that kills where it pleases and flies through the bones of the living. The brutality is less overt in Two Autumn, but considering that there is a granary, a hook or scythe like implement, and a cider press, we can see that man kills nature throughout the poem. These poems are also image heavy, perhaps reflecting the vitality of the natural world. If you were to contrast these poems though, you could look at the brutality again. In Hawk Roosting, the hawk seems to be brutal just because it can be. After all, it kills where it pleases because it owns all of creation and acknowledges that no arguments assert its right to do this. The necessity of harvest is more implicit in Two Autumn, but the sad tone that is evoked in the final stanza suggests that the persona is sad to see Autumn go, whereas the abundance of natural imagery in the poem also hints that the cyclical nature of time, as well as the brutality that Autumn brings, is perfectly normal and just. Both poems have controlled structures, those tight four line stanzas of hawk roosting and that ode form of two autumn. But the personal thing seemingly controlling that structure differs in the poems. Whilst the hawk is very much in control in hawk roosting, as I've suggested earlier, the ode form has many more rules and constraints, making it much more artificial and clearly man-made. This reinforces the idea of who has ultimate control in these poems. Nature is superior in hawk roosting, whereas man has greater power in Two Autumn. Okay, those are the middle six poems in the WJEC Educast Poetry Anthology and the poems that they might compare to discussed. If this video has helped you out, please do consider giving it a like. If you disagree with my comparisons or think you would prefer to compare one of the poems to something else, let me know down in the comment section below. I'll also be covering the final six poems in a third video, so if you want to make sure that you definitely catch that, make sure that you're subscribed to my channel and hey, why not turn on those notifications too. As ever, I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. If you are revising, please do remember to take frequent short breaks, as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student, which is what I think you deserve to be. So there we go, that's what you could choose to compare as imperceptibly as grief, cosy opponent jeer, a wife in London, Valentine, deaf of a naturalist and hawk roosting too. I really do hope that this video has helped you with your GCSE revision and that you're feeling much more confident now in comparing those poems. Cheers.